It's January 2005, and the Palomar Observatory has just announced the discovery of Eris, a new dwarf planet, the second largest in our solar system, and lying just beyond the orbit of Neptune in the Kuiper Belt. This was truly a great achievement, one which would revolutionise astrophysics. Or was it? Turn your attention to Phobata, a super-Earth-type planet which orbits a star over 2,300 light-years away. Phobata isn't anything special. It's a few times heavier than Earth and slightly larger, but here's the twist. Phobata was also discovered in January, the January of 1992. That's 13 years before the announcement of Eris. How was a fairly average exoplanet all the way in the Virgo constellation discovered over a decade before Eris, the ninth most massive known object orbiting our own Sun? It's time to talk about exoplanet detection. The word exoplanet is the name given to any object which fits the typical planet requirements but lies outside of our own solar system. That can be inferred by the prefix exo meaning extrasolar or beyond the Sun. As of August 2023, there have been 5,483 confirmed exoplanets in 4,082 planetary systems. Every single one of them was detected using one of just 11 different methods. Phobata was one of the first exoplanets to be discovered. In fact, it was the first to be confirmed, along with Poltergeist, another super-Earth orbiting the same star. Or, to be more precise, Pulsar. These are neutron stars which are rotating incredibly quickly. The one in our example rotates around once every 6 milliseconds, that's the entire star spinning over 160 times per second. But the useful feature about this type of star is that it can act as one of the most precise clocks in all of nature. You see, pulsars are also highly magnetised and emit beams of electromagnetic radiation, or radio waves. Combine this with how fast it's spinning, and well, we have a super regular radio pulse time interval counter, aka the universe's very own clock. You can think of this as kind of like a lighthouse, the spinning light ray turns at a constant pace. Only difference is that the beam for pulsars is in the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum and is spinning hundreds of times per second, but the point remains. However, this extremely regular clock will periodically and predictably slow down and speed up by a few percent when a planet is orbiting the pulsar due to the variation in the star's orbit. Though, thanks to how precise pulsar timing is, this can be analysed and used to detect exoplanets which are significantly far away from the star. And it was this method which was the very first used to detect an exoplanet, way back in 1992. Sadly for scientists, pulsars are extremely rare, and so far only 9 exoplanets have been discovered using this method. Worse still for all you alien lovers, the unbelievable amounts of radiation given off by a pulsar would make it almost impossible for any life to survive on a planet orbiting one. But let's not get our hopes down, because luckily there's a different method, a wonderful and extremely successful procedure known as transit photometry, which is so far responsible for the discovery of over 4,000 exoplanets. That's almost three quarters of every verified exoplanet. Transits are very simple to understand in theory, but happen very rarely. They occur when a planet passes in between their host star and our line of sight as they orbit it. This isn't special to exoplanets either. It also happens with Mercury and Venus too as sometimes when they pass between us and the Sun, they cross the observed stellar disk. I've made a video on how that simple idea can be used to work out the astronomical unit, or the distance to the Sun, intuitively. Obviously, we can't observe this happening with planets further away from the Sun than Earth, unless some kind of apocalyptic event was occurring. With exoplanets, if they just so happen to be orbiting in a plane that causes them to intersect our line of sight to their host star, we can indirectly detect their transit. Telescopes targeted on the star measure its luminosity or brightness to dip due to an exoplanet passing in front of it, and subsequently blocking out some of the light. When this happens, we can record and plot a graph of how the star's luminosity changes as time goes on. Here is one of those plots. You can see the duration of the transit just by counting how many days pass during the period of dimming. Another feature you'll notice is that the drop in brightness is regular, happening periodically. This effectively confirms it's to do with an exoplanet transit, since as we know, gravitational planetary orbits are regular and happen in constant time periods. I said earlier that seeing this was rare, and that's because the chance of having a planet orbiting in a way that intersects our line of sight to a star is tiny. Yet due to the sheer vastness of space and the number of stars there are, it's inevitable we'll see this effect, leading to thousands of confirmed exoplanets because of it. Although it's even more rare, this can also happen with star systems which have numerous planets in transits as seen from Earth. Then, the graph might look something like this, where there's two or more periodic dips in luminosity, corresponding to the number of exoplanets orbiting the star. Another great thing 
is that the depth of those brightness drops is related to the radius or physical size of the exoplanet causing it. Of course, the larger the planet, the more light it blocks out, and so astronomers can use this data to quantitatively work out the size of each exoplanet as well. But say you weren't satisfied knowing the radius of an exoplanet, and you instead wanted to know its mass. Then you would need to use the next method of exoplanet detection, the radial velocity method. The mass of an exoplanet is proportional to the amount of gravity it exerts, and while this is significantly smaller than the gravity of the parent star, it can still be enough to generate a wobble in the orbit of the star as the planet completes its own orbit. In physics, we say that the planet's gravitational force causes the star to undergo a reflex motion about the star-planet barycenter, or center of mass. If the star just so happens to be wobbling forward and backwards in our line of sight, we can detect the wobble through the Doppler shifting of the light it emits. You'll likely know that motion towards an object causes light from it to have its wavelength decreased in that direction, known as blue shift, and the reverse also being true and known as red shift. The reflex motion of the star causes this to happen, which we can then detect using telescopes. Here's another graph showing this. The reflex velocities are sinusoidal in nature due to the near circular orbits and are also tiny, often only tens of meters per second, but just enough for us to detect and infer the existence of exoplanets. By also observing the inclination of the exoplanet's orbit with respect to us and the period of its orbit, we can use some clever mathematics and laws of orbital motion to deduce the relative mass of the planet compared to the star. While this method has only yielded the second most number of exoplanet discoveries, it was the first to be used in detecting them around a main sequence star like our Sun in 1995. Other than the two titans of exoplanet discovery methods, transit photometry and radial velocity Doppler measurements, there are a few other, less widely used, but still feasible processes humanity has implemented. One of these is called astrometry, which is similar to the previously discussed radial velocity method. Instead for when the star is wobbling and orbiting the barycenter within our line of sight, Astrometry analyzes stars which do so perpendicular to it. Essentially, we can see how the motion of stars appear to do little strange spins and peculiar loops across the sky over time, which only happens when there's an extrasolar planet orbiting it within the plane of the sky. Another detection method comes from microlensing, very similar to gravitational lensing, where incredibly high mass objects like entire galaxy clusters or black holes cause the light from objects behind them to bend and be deflected, creating what are known as Einstein rings and reflecting images across the sky. Very occasionally, background stars can have their light lensed by stars, which are closer, and if they are close enough or have a large enough exoplanet orbiting them, the lensing effect can be magnified and increased, due to the planet's mass and gravity also contributing. The radius of the resulting Einstein ring can be used to work out the mass of the gravitational lens and confirm the presence of exoplanets. Using our enhanced optics, we can also finally now do direct imaging of some exoplanets by aiming our telescopes at them when light from their parent stars are reflecting nicely off of their surfaces. However, the final three methods mentioned along with the initial pulsar timing method are nowhere near as popular or applicable to as many exoplanets as the two main ones. To show this, here's a recent chart showing the number of exoplanets discovered using each method. So while there's plenty of options to choose from, almost all are found as a result of transit or radial velocity methods. For reference, here's yet another such graph showing the number of exoplanets discovered by year. I'm sure in the future there will be game-changing new detection methods available and the total number detected will drastically increase year on year. If you've made it this far and enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. It's free, it helps on my channel a bunch and you can always change your mind. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.